Welcome everybody to one more Authors at Google Talk. Uh, today with us is Ian Hoder, who is going to talk uh, about the ritual origins of settled life in the Middle East, uh, specifically Gebekli and Chatel Hölyük, two archaeological sites uh, from the early Neolithic. Uh, Ian Hodder was trained at the Institute of Archaeology, University College London, and at Cambridge University, where he obtained his PhD in 1975. After a brief period teaching at Leeds, he returned to Cambridge, where he taught until 1999. During that time, he became professor of archaeology and was elected a fellow of the British Academy. In 1999, he moved to teach at Stanford University as Don Levy family professor in the Department of Anthropology and director of the Stanford Archaeology Center. His main large-scale excavation projects have been at Hatherham in the east of England and Chatel Hoyuk in Turkey, where he has worked since 1993. He has been awarded the Oscar Montelius Medal by the Swedish Society of Antiquaries. The Huxley Memorial Medal by the Royal Anthropological Institute has been a Guggenheim Fellow and has honorary doctorates from Bristol and Leiden Universities. His main books include Spatial Analysis in Archaeology, Symbols in Action, Reading the Past, The Domestication of Europe, The Archaeological Process, The Leopard's Tale, Revealing the, Myster the Mysteries of Chatel Hoyuk, uh, Entangled, and Archaeology of the Relationship Between Humans and Things. Please uh, join me in welcoming Ian Hodder to Google. So I wanted to start by thanking Boris and Talks at Google for inviting me uh, to come and talk to you about um, uh, the topic of ritual origins in the, the Middle East, which must be a rather long way from your usual sets of interests. Um, and uh, so I look forward to your, to your comments on what I'm going to, to say. I, I'm going to be talking uh, about the origins of settled life uh, in uh, the Middle East and arguing that um, uh, the, new, new, the new findings suggest that ritual and social symbolism of various sorts turns out to be very key uh, to the origins of settled life. Uh, and I'm going to be using uh, the, new, the new excavations at Gerbeckli uh, as an example, uh, but also using the excavations that I've been carrying out at uh, Chattel Huyuk in Turkey uh, as, an, as an example. So, so the, the problem is a very straightforward run, one, really, uh, which is that for the vast majority of uh, human life on Earth, we have been uh, hunter-gatherers. And so for hundreds of thousands of years, uh, modern humans uh, moved around uh, the landscape in very small groups, uh, small uh, settlements, short-term settlements as hunters and uh, gatherers, leaving these sorts of traces, scatters of bones and uh, stone tools uh, reconstructed in the way that you see down there. So for, for a long time then, people were living in this sort of low-density, scattered, uh, mobile uh, way. And then between um, uh, 10,000 10, and 7,000 uh, BC, uh, things changed, and we ended up living uh, in things like this. Uh, large agglomerations, uh, this is Chattel Huyuk that we'll come back to later, of maybe uh, 8,000 people living clustered together over long periods of time. So the question is, why, why did that happen? Why aren't we still hunters and gatherers? How, how, why did this change occur, and why did it occur at this particular moment? <clears throat> One of the um, contributory factors is undou undoubtedly climate, because it's clear that um, uh, during the, 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 the last uh, ice age, one has a, a cold climate that warms up around 10,000 BC, and so you have the modern warmer uh, climate. This, this graph doesn't show the contemporary uh, warming, but you see this fairly stable period from, from about 10,000 BC, and the, the, the emergence of settled life occurs all around the world at about this sort of Holocene period, in the early Holocene. So it's undoubtedly the case that climate has something to do with this shift. But most people feel that climate isn't 
the, uh, the sole factor, but maybe not even the main factor, because there are earlier warmer, warmer periods way back in the, uh, in the Ice Age, um, in the Pleistocene, uh, w which did not lead to the same response. So there are clearly other factors that have to be involved. And by far the sort of dominant theories, the dominant view of uh, why settled life began, why, we, why urbanism, if you like, the origins of urbanism began, are the, the, the main theories derived from Karl Marx and derived from Karl Marx in prehistory uh, it, it is the figure of V. Gordon Child who, who coined the term the Neolithic Revolution. And so following Marx, he saw this as a revolutionary uh, event uh, that, that created settled life. And he saw it as primarily uh, the result of um, in, an intensification of uh, use of the, the environment, use of resources, particularly the domestication of plants and animals. So the idea was that domestication of plants and animals meant that you could get more resources out of a given area of land, which meant that people could stay there longer and, and uh, collect, and larger numbers of people could be supported. There were other ancillary, ancillary ideas, such that uh, the collection of, um, the, the domestication of plants and animals uh, led to the creation of a surplus, which would allow people to store and build up property and have ownership, uh, and that that was also seen as uh, a, an important development at this time, linked ultimately to the development of ranking and social hierarchy. But the key idea was, was that the, 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 the domestication of plants and animals was the trigger that allowed people to live in the same place over a long period of time and aggregate. Now, the, the, the idea of a revolution has been largely uh, discredited. It's clear that the, the process of, uh, of settling down was a very, very long, slow one that took thousands and thousands of years. But the idea that um, uh, the domestication of plants and animals was key to settled life has remained a very, very important idea, that basically the economy is what did it. <clears throat> and that's why the site of Gobekli is very important, because Gobekli basically turns this on its head. Because Gobekli is a, a very remarkable site that, that, uh, that disproves that, that basic idea. And so Gobekli itself uh, has been excavated by the German uh, Archaeological Institute. Uh, the, ex the excavator there um, for a long time was Klaus uh, Schmidt who sadly died uh, recently, and the excavations uh, are continuing uh, nevertheless. And I'm very grateful to uh, Lee Clare for allowing me access to some of these images and results that I'm going to be talking about. So Gobekli Tepe is in uh, southeast Turkey, and you can see that it's a, a, a set of mounds on a very high hill that overlooks uh, a really impressive landscape out there in southeast Turkey. So it's a very, very dominant, prominent uh, location. And if we look at the excavations that are taking place on this hill, we find that um, we see these very remarkable circles of upright stones, these sort of megalithic circles with uh, two interior um, uh, stones as well, these upright uh, monoliths creating these uh, circles, a number of them uh, on this mound. And this is all beginning around uh, 9000 BC, so very, very early. And <clears throat> these upright pillars or monoliths uh, or stele uh, have, are yet more remarkable because they have all this really wonderful imagery on that I'll come back to uh, later. Many of these stones are enormous uh, in size, uh, so, uh, some up to six meters uh, high. R enormous skill to produce them, very thin, often talked of as T-shaped pillars because they have that sort of overall uh, T-shape. Clearly to, to construct these sorts of um, monuments involves a lot of labor by a lot of people. And so one of the most striking things is 
that, uh, that there must have been a lot of collective organization in order to produce these, these monuments. The quarrying is done fairly locally, but simply the, the, the carving out, the construction of them, the, the, the putting them upright and the construction of these walls around them in, involves a huge amount of, uh, huge amount of labor. Now, the, distinct, the, the very important aspect about this is that this is a society which does not yet have full plants and animal domestication. So these are really still uh, hunter-gatherers. I mean, the, 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 there's a beginning to be a move towards uh, um, domestication of plants and animals, but that hasn't yet occurred here at around 9000 uh, BC. So these are basically, basically hunter-gatherer societies who are coming together to create these large monuments in which a lot of collective labor is needed. And that seems somehow to then generate uh, occupation around it. So here is uh, a photograph of these circular stone uh, constructions, and there's a plan here. And th this is the earliest phase. And then you can see around it there are these sort of very simple round or roundish houses that are emerge. And then through time, you begin to get rectangular houses. And in fact, the temples, the equivalents of those things, become, um, become rectangular. So that the sequence that one can um, reconstruct here is that people originally come together, perhaps from a very large landscape, they come together in order to con construct these monuments, these ritual uh, circles themselves. And then gradually people live and live there longer and longer until you have a settlement that grows up around them. So this is very much saying that at a very early date, hunter-gatherers are coming, to date, coming together to create community um, out of uh, reasons that are, that are social and ritual. And this, this is not the, econo e the economy that is the driving force here. Indeed, uh, Gobekli has a lot of these circles. Uh, th this is the area that we've just been looking at where excavation has been taken place. They've done ground penetrating radar in the uh, other, other parts of this uh, set of mounds on this high hilltop. And you can see that the ground penetrating radar is picking up lots of these circles. In fact, there seem to be about 18 uh, of these uh, circles uh, on the site. <clears throat> if we look at the stones themselves, um, it's been argued that they represent uh, uh, people in some way, that they're representations of mythical people or ancestors in some way. And, and you can see that they've got those, the arms coming down on the side there, and then the hand, if you like, on the, uh, on the front. And this, there's the belt, it's interpreted as a belt going round, and this is the, uh, a loincloth uh, at the front. Uh, and as I said before, the, the T-shape at the top suggests to many people that these are anthropomorphic and that they, they somehow maybe represent ancestors or important mythical uh, beings. And then on these ancestors or on these uh, uh, stele, there's a whole sort of carving, lots of carving of various types of um, uh, uh, imagery much of it to do with violence uh, um, and, uh, and, uh, and sex and, uh, and sometimes death. So, for example, you see um, uh, lions here, uh, bulls uh, and uh, wild boar here, uh, also some bird-type uh, forms. Uh, at the top in the middle, uh, there's uh, an image of a woman either being penetrated or, or menstruating. It's not exactly clear what's, uh, how to interpret that. But on the whole, the imagery is very male. Uh, and I don't know if you can see from where you're sitting, but most of the wild animals have uh, a male genitalia uh, clearly shown. A lot of the imagery is associated with violence uh, in, in, in various ways. Here's another one of these T-shaped pillars uh, with uh, a wild boar and this sort of uh, monstrous figure uh, crawling up and down it. And here's a, one of these walls uh, going around these enclosures uh, with a serpent-type uh, figure coming, coming out of it. You can see another image of that there and uh, these sort of bared teeth and fangs uh, of, of these sort of uh, 
uh, mythical creatures and snakes and so on. Here's another of these T-shaped forms over here with a wild boar and perhaps a fox there and uh, these ducky type things. Um, the, the, over here, uh, there's um, a, uh, a, a very fascinating uh, stone. Uh, again, you see the T-shape generally. What, what, just one point to make is that I'm talking about these as if it's all one phase. In fact, the stratigraphy is much more complex than that. And you can see how this, this pillar here has had this wall built up against it at a later date. And there's lots of use and reuse of these things over time. But th th this, um, this particular uh, image is, I think, a, a, a fascinating one. Uh, I won't go through all the different parts of it, but you can see sort of wild uh, and dangerous animals again. The, there's a, a, um, some sort of uh, scorpion uh, there. We often get spiders. Uh, you can see the scorpion tail again here and a wild boar or something coming out the side there. But, but um, perhaps most fascinating are these sort of birds here that uh, look vaguely humanoid I and mean, there's some sort of human bird mixing going on here. And there is this sort of, this bird here that seems to be doing something with a, you know, a sph spherical object, um, perhaps playing with a ball or something. Uh, and then down here you have this um, bird with, on its back is a, a human with an erect penis and without a head. And you, we'll talk, I'll talk, we'll talk later about sort of headlessness and how that's such an important part of this symbolism. But it's very, it's very tempting as, as someone has done here to suggest that that, that has actually the head that the bird has taken and, and is somehow taking off or playing with uh, from that, um, from that body, and um, here you've got a, a close-up of that. So, Gebekli um, is um, right in the middle uh, here. If I can get this to work. So just in here, and it's a a larger version of a series of sites that gradually emerge that are shown by these uh, T-shaped uh, symbols uh, in um, up, Upper Mesopotamia. And through time, a whole series of other sites emerge shown by these circles that are similar in the sense that they, they start in hunter-gatherer contexts with big ritual um, structures of various sort and then you have a set of houses uh, around them. So one can talk then about, throughout this region, about a sort of settling down uh, and uh, a focus on these uh, important ritual uh, buildings and centers. And what's fascinating is that uh, recent uh, genetic work on uh, wheat has shown that the first domestication of einkorn wheat probably began at Karajadar, which is right in the center of all this stuff. And so it's possible very much to turn the sort of Marx-Childian uh, theory on its head and to argue that it, it was the settling down that led to the need for more intensive uh, production and then ultimately to the domestication of wheat and of course sheep uh, and goat and uh, the full range of domesticates that we know come from uh, the Middle East during the, the Neolithic. Just, just to point out, there are a number of other uh, sites, just uh, as I've just shown you, but the, the, just, to, just, to sh just to show how widespread they are, here's in Jordan, a site called Wadi Fainan, which again has some sort of big, uh, complex ritual uh, structure up there and a whole series of small houses that, uh, that cluster around it. Uh, another site that you will all have heard of is Jericho, uh, and uh, Jericho has very important uh, Neolithic levels, uh, very, very important con uh, concentration of early, uh, early settled life. And very, as part of that, there is this uh, very remarkable tower, a monumental tower, uh, that has a stairway that goes up and would have gone up to the top, in which there is all, there are, but there is also uh, uh, burials, human burials that are placed in this. So again, we have the cent some sort of large ritual um, um, collective structure 
uh, around which uh, settlement occurs. So this new story about the origin of uh, settled life is, is a fascinating one. And we, we can step forward a little bit, a few thousand years. We've we just been looking at uh, Gebekli, which is around, starts around 9000 BC. I'm moving on now to Chatelhuyuk, which is about uh, 7000 BC, where we'll see lots of parallels, but also contrasts uh, with uh, Gebekli. And what we're finding at Chatelhuyuk adds a lot to the story. So this is the, the mound at uh, Chatelhuyuk that is Neolithic in date. And you can see it's in the Konya Plain, which is about, um, uh, so the, the site is about um, uh, three to four hours south of uh, Ankara by car. <coughs> and this is how we uh, reconstruct Chatelhuyuk. We, al we already saw earlier uh, an image of how we see it in detail, but this is in its, in its landscape. So this is, as I said before, a large concentration of people. We think up to 8,000 people were, were living here. So we've moved on from Gebekli in the sense that these are much larger agglomerations of people. There's also a big difference from Gebekli uh, in that now we have uh, agriculture. So th this, this is a site that has domesticated sheep and it has domesticated plants. A lot of the resources are still wild, and as we'll see later, the cattle in particular are still wild. But this is a society that has started, uh, has started agriculture. And the other thing that we see is that there is no ritual center here. There's no um, ceremonial center, no circles of stones no, of, of any sort. There are no public buildings. Uh, th this is just a very, very large number of people uh, in, in relative terms, live, living in one place. Another very important part of this is that they live there for a long time. This is very stable. These have be become very stable societies, quite the opposite of those Upper Paleolithic Pleistocene societies. At Chadalhuyuk, this, this is where we got about, this is where we were excavating in the south part of the, the site uh, in a, a small area. Uh, and um, we have about 21 meters of occupation, about 18 levels. So people lived on houses, knocked them down, built other houses on top, and so on and so forth over, over a thousand years. So this incredibly stable uh, society doing the same thing repetitively over a very, very long period of time. So by this time, people have really got the answer. I mean, they really know how to be stable, long-term uh, 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 settlements. In the, in, a nor in the north part of the site, we were excavating uh, in order to find not so much the depth of occupation, but to understand what it looks like at any one moment in time. And this gives you a sense of how all the houses are tightly packed together. In fact, they're so tightly packed together, there is no room for streets. Uh, and although you might think that these are alleyways and so on, uh, these actually were used just for rubbish deposition and they're not streets. People moved around on the surface of the, on the, on the roofs of the houses and then went down a, a ladder uh, in, into the interior. So uh, one of the questions is, how is it possible for people to live, large numbers of people to live together in this sort of collective way? How, how was that organized? And in order to understand how it was organized, it's important to look inside the houses and try to make sense of the elaborate symbolism and ritual that we find there. These are pictures taken from the work that James Mellart did at Chatelhuyuk in the 1960s. And uh, you can see here the, the ladder that people would move to come down from the roof, and they come down into uh, the, the south, south part of the house, where there is lots of uh, evidence of food and uh, uh, food preparation. And then you see all the other types of symbolism, a lot of it to do with bulls in various ways. But you also see uh, up the top there something that should be reminiscent to you, which is uh, headless bodies and birds. So th this is sort of a link to, to, to Gobekli. 
Uh, we also saw lots of bulls at Gebekli. So there are, there are lots of parallels in, in, the, in the symbolism of the two sites. Here, here is the, uh, uh, a pair of bull horns that are set around. These are wild bull horns that are set around a platform uh, in one of these houses. And I'm just going to play you uh, a little uh, reconstruction uh, uh, done by a, a group called uh, Corinth uh, of what it looked like inside these uh, houses. So this is turning around and looking at the south part of the house where you would come down the ladder and where you have uh, the, the, the concentration of domestic activities, particularly around the hearth uh, and around the oven. And in our excavations, we find large amounts of uh, dense concentrations of everyday activity uh, in this area. There are also entrances into side rooms. And then as you move northwards in the house, there's lots of uh, other types of uh, elaborate uh, symbolism around these various platforms. The, the roof is often flat, but in this case, it seems to have been modified in order to uh, allow for this particular image, which I'll explain later, we think is a, a bear, a wild bear. There are other types of uh, animals, but particularly the, the, skulls or, or the skulls of wild bulls play a very important part in, in the imagery inside these houses. And one of the most fascinating things about this focus on wild bulls is that at this time at Chadalhuyuk, the, the cattle are not domesticated. But in the later levels, they are domesticated. And so it seems that one can argue again that initially uh, people are interested in animals for ritual or social symbolic reasons, and that itself then leads to the domestication of cattle uh, as, uh, later on. So again, it seems like ritual and social functions are important, and that leads a sort of as, a, as an accidental bribe byproduct uh, to the, dom the actual domestication uh, of animals, of cattle in this case. We've already seen this type of figure with upraised arms in that last uh, reconstruction. This is one of, one of the uh, versions of that. And uh, we think that these are probably uh, bears. And we've done, done that because we find these uh, stamp seals that we, we, we think are clearly bears. And they have the same sort of upraised and up, uh, upraised arms and legs type of uh, um, uh, form. And we also find uh, traces of uh, bear claws. So we think bear claws were stuck in the walls here and then removed when the thing is abandoned. So there are bear claws, and we also find the, the, the tusks of wild, a wild boar stuck into walls. Uh, pairs of leopards are another important theme at uh, Chattelhuyuk. Uh, and um, we also find the, cl the uh, claws of leopards uh, in, in, the, in the site. So there seems to be a real fascination with wild animals and with bringing in the horns, the teeth, the tusks, the claws and so on of them into the house and sticking them into the walls. The, some of the houses have this wonderful, uh, these wonderful paintings that, that seem to show initially, you might think, oh, these are people hunting wild animals. But in fact, they're, they're not. They're, they're teasing and baiting them. And so what you see is in the case of bearded men uh, wearing these spotted things around their waist, which we interpret as leopard skins. And they are pulling the tail and pulling the snout and pulling the tongue of this deer, or this stag, again with, with a, a, an erect penis. And you remember that relates to the, the, the type of symbolism we saw at Gobekli. And this is, you can't see this so well, but this is a, a bull, again, with lots of people around wearing leopard skins, teasing and baiting the, the bull. And I'm just going to show you um, a, another little uh, video a reconstruction. This, this is uh, incorrectly called the shrine um, of, the, um, uh, of the hunters, uh, but we don't see these as shrines anymore. We see them as houses. And as I said, they're not really hunting. They're, they're teasing and baiting. But they, what this, this, this reconstruction by a team at Southampton does very well is, is to give, give you a sense of how 
the, these paintings are arranged uh, in a house. You see people jumping on, teasing this bear here, wild bear, and dancing and or running towards that particular set of activities there. Here, here's, a, here's that image of the, of the bull with lots of people around it and um, uh, teasing and baiting other types of animals uh, over there. So the important thing is lots and lots of people involved in these images. And again, this is in, this is in the context of domestic, uh, a domestic house coming down the ladder uh, with the oven beneath the adder in, ladder in the south part of the house. And the way we, we interpret this is that um, we think that the, these teasing and baiting rituals took place uh, and then the animals were killed and then we have evidence on the site of feasting, so large amounts of people feasting uh, on these wild animals, uh, and then taking uh, various uh, tokens or symbols of those animals and putting them in the house as memories or mementos of these important social events when people gathered uh, and, uh, and, uh, and came together in, in killing and eating these, these animals. So we have then this evidence of collective action, uh, a chattel huyuk, associated with uh, wild animals. You might have thought that all of this organization, this large number of people living together, would have necessitated some sort of central hierarchy. But that is not what we find at chattel huyuk. We think chattel huyuk is uh, aggressively egalitarian uh, society, where showing difference was not really allowed. So what we've done here, for example, is uh, on this line is we just all ordered all the houses uh, uh, from the less elaborate to the more elaborate, where more elaborate means they have more of that type of symbolism I've just been showing you. And if we try and correlate that with, for example, this other line is the number of uh, figurines that are found in the house, you might have thought that the more elaborate houses, the higher status houses, would have more figurines, but they don't. It, there, is, there is no correlation. And we can't find any correlation at all with anything that relates to the elaborateness of the house. So the more elaborate houses with more symbolism and bull's horns and things in them do not have more storage, for example. They have the same or less storage as other buildings. Uh, they don't have more evidence of production in any way. So th this seems to be a society in which you could have a lot of symbolism in your house, but that doesn't mean that you have higher status in some way. In fact, we can find no chiefly house or chiefly center or high status house or high status. Everybody seems to be about the same. Everybody has the same amount of storage, the same amount of productive faci facility and so on. So as I said, this is a very egalitarian society. So that again, raises even more strongly the issue of how do you hold people together, 8,000 people together, living day to day, how do you hold all that together and organize it all without any central authority? And we've seen that one of the ways you do that is by having collective rituals associated with wild animals. But I want to show you some other ways in which I think uh, it was uh, done. So this is um, uh, um, a model of uh, part of the excavation area, and you can see these different houses that we've been excavating. But I want to focus on that particular uh, building, building uh, 80. And uh, this is looking down into building 80. The west wall here has, has been removed. We're looking at the north and the east wall. And here in the south part of this main room, again, we have the oven and the hearth is just, you can't see it down in here. And um, this is the platform where the ladder comes down from the roof, so you'd walk down into this building here, uh, above the oven, come into the building, and move northwards where you have all these platforms. These scars on the wall are where originally you would have had uh, upright posts that helped to hold the, uh, hold the house uh, up. But when we were working on this bit of the wall here, uh, we found um, painting, and as we gradually uh, took off the hundreds and hundreds of very fine layers of plaster that were probably put on monthly during the Neolithic in, in order to keep the house white and clean, as we took off these hundreds of layers, 
we came down to this uh, painting that um, has a very sort of uh, simple and distinctive form, has these uprights and then these sort of triangles on the side and then this sort of uh, brick-shaped pattern. And again, you see it here, the upright and the triangle in the brick-shaped pattern. And uh, this is it again, and this is in this building here. There's another painting right on the other side of the excavated area, which again has these uprights and the triangles and the brick-shaped design in between. So it's very, very difficult to imagine these, the people who made these two uh, um, paintings didn't see each other's painting. I mean, this is clearly a sign of a, of a connection. There are no other paintings like this through the area. So this is a, a very particular link between these two buildings. It suggests a particular part of a, a network there. And if we do this for all the other symbols, we end up with this very, very complicated uh, set of links between houses. I've, I've linked here houses that have leopard reliefs or have these bare splayed figures or horn benches or painted hands or something. You know, so these different ways in which these, these symbols connect uh, different parts of the, um, of the settlement. Another very important way that um, buildings were connected uh, is through, uh, the, through burial. And I haven't talked so far about how people were buried, but Chadalhuyuk is as much a necropolis as, is, as it is a settlement. And the size of these circles here is an indicator of uh, how many people are buried beneath the floors uh, of the houses. And you can see that some houses have no burials, whereas some have quite a lot. So beneath the, beneath the house floors, people are buried, and you can have up to 60, 62 people buried beneath one house floor. And 62 is many too, we think is many too many people to be produced by one small family living in, in one of these houses. So this suggests that people are being buried into these houses from other houses, and that's why some houses have lots of burials and some have uh, none. So we see that houses are connected by the fact that they bury together. Okay, so there's a community of houses that bury their dead in a central burial house. And as I said before, that central burial house is no different from any other house. It doesn't have any status or any or special status. It is just a burial house. Um, but we also find that the people buried in these um, houses ate together. And we know that because uh, we can study the uh, isotopes, the bone isotopes. And so here we've got carbon, carbon and nitrogen isotopes. And we're looking at individuals from these different houses. And the, 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 where you have the same symbol used, that's because they are, are buried in the same house. So you can see that there's actually a lot of clustering in this, but you can see that some clustering that's been shown, marked out, there is other clustering that overlaps here. And particularly this group of squares over here suggests some sort of clustering. So this suggests that people uh, ate together as well as buried together. So the group of houses that buried together also ate together. And you might think, oh, well, that's obvious. Th these are somehow extended nuclear families. But it becomes more complicated uh, than that. So we haven't been able, uh, I can't show you yet ancient DNA uh, results that, that uh, we're, we've um, been doing. Uh, we had great difficulty getting ancient DNA out of Chatelhuyuk. Uh, and we're, we're now in a new program that's, uh, that seems to be, be more successful. But I, so I can't show you results from the ancient DNA work. But what we have been doing is use uh, teeth as a proxy for uh, genetics, genetic uh, uh, proximity. So what, what has happened here is that we've taken teeth from the individuals in uh, the houses and measured 53 different uh, dimensions of teeth, which are thought to be uh, aspects of teeth which are genetically transmitted. And so it should be the case that if you find uh, clusters of uh, individuals with similar teeth, that they, they would, should be closely uh, related genetically. So we do find these clusters, but they're not in the houses. They're all spread around all over the place. It's not the case that people who are buried in the same house 
are any more closely related to each other than people in the community at large. So how do you explain that? Well, w the way we explain it, and there are ethnographic parallels for this, is that soon after birth, children are distributed around the settlement. So you don't grow up with your mother and father, your genetic mother and father. You grow up with um, you know, other members of the community in other buildings, in other houses. So cross-cutting all of this, you know, cross-cutting the groups of people who bury and, and have all these symbols, you also have all the genetic cross-cutting things where people are linked to each other through their um, genetic uh, um, histories. In a way, the, the whole of Chattelhuyuk, because of this, this sort of way children are treated, the whole of Chattelhuyuk is one family that's all sort of tied together. And so this is a, a, a very, very dense network. It, it means that any individual house can call on lots and lots of different types of relationship if they run out of food or if they have a bad year, if they have difficulties in some sort. So why do people come together at Chattelhuyuk? In my view, they mainly come together, not only at this site, at other sites, because they can link into these very, very dense, complex networks that supports them when, when, they're, when there are times of hardship or uh, they need support. It, it, by coming together, one can become involved in this very dense network. And it's this dense, dense network and the sets of beliefs that go along with it that create the conformity and that create the, um, uh, the set of social rules that organize and run the society as a whole. I just want to add another way in which this happens. So at Chattelhuyuk, when you were buried, you sometimes had your uh, head removed after a period of time. So maybe a year later, somebody went down and took off the head from that individual and then, then reburied the bones and so on. So the head was, was taken out and these heads, we know, were kept for a long period of time. So we, they, they were often painted. Uh, sometimes the, the facial features were plastered back onto the, onto the skull. They were circulated for a long period of time. And then ultimately, they were deposited in various ways. Sometimes they were deposited at the base of the posts that hold up the house. To, so the ancestor, if you like, was holding up the house. In this particular case, there's a plastered skull here. You can't probably see it very well, but there's a skull in here with the nose and the facial features plastered on. Uh, and this is a reconstruction here, the plastered face. And this is a, wom a woman's skull, and this is a, um, a, a woman. So, so this, this, this skull was kept in society for a number of, uh, we think, quite a long period of time before being deposited with this uh, woman when she uh, was buried. So if you came to Chattelhuyuk, uh, you would, as you moved around the site, you, you, would, you would find uh, in the Neolithic that there were body parts, human body parts, that were being circulated in the community as a whole. These are mainly skulls, but we also have evidence that arms and legs and other parts of the body were kept and circulated. So again, you, you see how this creates a network. All, all the people who are associated with the skull, who are related to the skull, all the people who were related to the individual from whom the skull was obtained and so on, again, it creates this very, very sort of dense network uh, of people. So what I've tried to argue is that uh, at one level, there are a lot of similarities between Gebekli and Chattelhuyuk, very, very similar uh, sets of uh, symbolisms. But, it, but the, the big difference is that at Chattelhuyuk, this has become a domestic cult and it's integrated into everyday life. And at Gebekli, it's mu very much part of a ritual uh, uh, center. And what I, what, what, in, in concluding, what, what I've been trying to argue is that uh, the, these types of collective ritual action occur in both places associated with the killing, teasing, baiting, and feasting on wild animals and creating memories around those uh, events. But as well as this focus on the collective uh, of that type, we also get the focus on, the de on death and ancestry, 
which, which not only, again, create linkages and relationships between people, but also, very crucially, create time depth. So it's not, it's not enough to have a network. You need to have that network that has time depth. And that's because of the nature of intensive um, use, use of resources and agriculture. In agriculture, uh, there is a delayed return for your labor input. As a hunter-gatherer, we go off and kill an animal, and we, sh we share it, and then we can just disperse. There's nothing to hold us together. But with farming, we clear the land together, and we invest in uh, plows or in um, other types of uh, equipment. So we've invested, and we have to somehow hold the community together before we get a return for that labor. And so the crucial distinction about farmers is that they have time depth. And the, the important thing is that time depth focus emerged very early, even before um, uh, farming and, and before settled life, that the focus on history making happens very, very early as hunter-gatherers become more intensive and start investing in more and more things. And that takes me into another topic, which is a topic of my book, which is entanglement because I think a very important key thing here, which I haven't talked about, is how humans just get entangled in more and more stuff. And that entanglement leads to longer term relationships of, of, of various sorts. But, but the, the domestication of plants and animals is, a, is an example of entanglement. But one can extend that to all the other types of things like houses and pottery and so on that people are beginning to make at this time. So thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to your uh, comments. Questions? How far is Chattel Holyoke from uh, Gebekli? Uh, quite a long way. Uh, so so um, Gebekli is right in the southeast of Turkey, and uh, Chattel Holyoke is, is right in the, in the middle. I, I feel I actually don't know what the numbers are, but it must be six, seven, eight hundred kilometers, something like that. How does um, the kind of observations of ritual and right, culture right. Uh, in this area compare to other areas of the ancient world? I think, um, well, I, I should say, when you say the ancient world, you know, that there are lots and lots of sort, uh, lo lo locations for the origins of agriculture. We, it used to be thought that there were very few, but now we recognize that you have independent origins in, you know, obviously in China, in, in New Guinea, in the Americas, in, in Africa, and so on. So there are lots and lots of independent, uh, with different crops and different processes and different sequences. So, um, on the whole, the modern view is that very different things happen in different places. And uh, I, I'm not trying to make an argument generally. I'm just trying to make an argument for this one particular case, which is often seen as a sort of key case, because it's probably the earliest. And for, um, yeah. Sorry, uh, I forgot the name, but there's a site in Jordan that's supposed to be... Um, Wadi Fainan? Uh, so? No, before that. It was in Gebekli. Steve Witten's book. No, in Jordan. It was Ein something or other that um, he, according to his book, it's been populated since, you know, 10,000 BC. And they also developed agriculture while they were living there. So they were first just collecting and then started planting later and stuff like that. I think it's about the same time. That's right. It's probably Ein Gazelle. Is that yes. the one? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so how, I mean, from what I read, they don't have the same amount of ritual um, as you described in Chatao Puyuk. And um, how would you compare the two? Uh, Ein Gazelle does have a lot of very elaborate ritual. I mean, it, particularly ancestral cults of various sorts. The, the, there are quite remarkable collections of these plastered figures. Uh, that were found in a big pit, uh, and um, do, you, do, you, do you know right, what? Not the no, no, no. So, so not the animal parts no, and the no, the, no, that's right. Yeah, and, and neither the type of structure where they, you know, use the roofs for access and just throw out stuff. They seem to be more easy going. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I mean, Gobekli and Chatal are really distinctive in that for various reasons they have this enormous concentration of, of stuff that survived. And you do get little bits and pieces of it in, in nearly all these other sites. You, know, you, you get, for example, a, a depiction of a headless body or a vulture or 
or, or a bucranium, which is a bull's head or something. So there are lots of bits and pieces it all over the place. Um, but in general terms, the, the, all of it is about either wild animals or about ancestry. And uh, I imagine that you have similar amounts of stuff, but a lot of it will be on things that haven't survived. And so Chattel Huyuk and Quebec League is just lucky for various reasons that they <coughs> stuff is preserved there. So do you find any evidence of conflict uh, with outsiders? Uh, do you find any evidence of, I don't know, you know like protection structures or something like that? Or is this just a settlement and, you know, like everybody was living peacefully? Yeah, so um, the, 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 dom the dominant view of, of my project so far has been that it's a, a, a society with very little violence. That there, there are not big defensive structures of any sort. Uh, and there is no evidence of, you know, lots of violent attack. So in, in many archaeological sites around the world of a later time period, you know, you find skeletons with arrowheads stuck through the spine or, or stuck through the skull or anything. We haven't found anything like that at all. So in, in my view, this was, this was a very, very uh, well-ordered, structured, um, peaceful uh, society. Chattahoeek is very much on its own. In a, in a very large landscape, so there's not a lot of comp competition from, from outside. Uh, but there has been recent work that is starting to challenge a bit of that because um, more careful study is showing a lot of depressed fractures on skulls in, on Chattahoyuk people. And the, these seem to be healed structures. So it's not that people were dying as a result of this. And so it may be more that there was a sort of um, ritual conflict warfare process going on, which is very common in these types of societies, where people would, you know, have fights and battles, and they would hit each other over the head, not to kill them, but as part of these sort of ritual practices and so on. So probably it wasn't as as peaceful as one imagines, uh, and we, we but we're doing more work on trying to understand that. But certainly there wasn't large scale warfare or anything like that. Well, with that, uh, join me in thanking Ian for sharing uh, the Neolithic story. Thank you.